we are going to start looking in uh, Old Testament scriptures uh, to begin to see uh, Adonai at work. But within that, we're also, in, in many cases, we're going to also see Elohim, meaning, okay, so Elohim, very simple, is the same word as the Trinity, but that's the name they use or was used for God and the first names used for God, name used for God. Um, and Adonai is, as what we've been talking about, is sort of the caregiver, the overseer of one who is going through not just troubles, not just trials, not just hardships, not just mean people, but going through the, the sufferings of Christ and are with him in that. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to look at some different scriptures um, and in looking at those scriptures, we're going to examine them, examine them in light of is is it talking about at all? Is it talking about Elohim? Now, okay, so that's one of the things. See, we talked about the Trinity. We talked about um, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and we we talked that. Uh, one of these could be going through sufferings or trials like Jesus did on the cross or before the cross during the trial and on the cross uh, he could Jesus could be down here instead of in here and one of these could be the Adonai which is the can I say it like this the official overseer caretaker of the things that pertain to to the person that's going through these sufferings. The suffering for us, if it's not Jesus, it's the sufferings of Christ. And we're with him in that. Okay. So the very first scripture to help us see this, and what we're going to do tonight before I say that, <clears throat> is we're going to start going through just the Psalms right now. We're going to go through the Psalms. Now, trust me, I have plenty more scriptures in other places, and we'll get to those. But I felt like the Lord showed me in Psalms some amazing things that began to, uh, in, in simple ways, without a big story, Old Testament story or something, but just in the Psalms, solidify this reality uh, uh, of both um, Elohim and of one needing an Adonai, Adonai and who that Adonai was that that particular time. All right, so let's begin Psalm 2. Most of us are familiar with Psalm 2, and uh, so let's just let's just read uh, beginning of verse 1 through 4. <clears throat> Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords. Uh, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. All right, you got a perfect situation here because what you've got is, and let me just, well, I'll probably read some so that we don't leave, miss anything out. But these scriptures are a direct um, uh, quote in relationship to the crucifixion. Okay, it pertains to it. Now, you may read that and say, well, I don't see that, but we'll, we'll straighten that out pretty quick here. But, but I don't want to jump too fast in here, but this just first part of this psalm has incredible stuff. All right. So some of my notes said Adonai is used mainly in situations that resemble the sufferings of Jesus, uh, the, the sufferings that Jesus endured at the trial and crucifixion. Therefore, this psalm is not just saying that all Christians will be persecuted by heathen ruler, rulers. Instead, it refers to the cross. All right. So 
we're trying to make an important point here. I said it, I'm saying it again, but I'm making an important point. Any old trial that you go through, anytime somebody's mean to you, any of, is not necessarily the sufferings of Christ. Okay? It is, you're having a trial. You're having a, you're going through some things, but those may not qualify as the sufferings of Christ, which is very specific, okay? And it has to do with going through, which I said, going through some of the specific things that Jesus did and handling them in the same spirit that he handled them then, he in you can handle them now. And if, and if we don't handle them, and this is important, if we don't handle them in that same spirit, they, they couldn't be the sufferings of Christ no matter what. Even if they were meant to be the sufferings of Christ, they're not. We, by our lack of proper reaction to the sufferings of Christ, by Christ crucified, by the Lamb, have voided that thing out that God intended to be the sufferings of Christ. All right, so, um, so back to the, the thought in, in uh, Psalms. I made the statement, this relates to Jesus' trial and being crucified. Now again, you can read that and go, I don't really get that. Okay, well, let's go to Acts chapter 4. Okay, and this is shortly after the crucifixion. And this is a guy named Peter who's going to stand up and start talking about these sufferings. And who's going to have seen in Psalm 2, what is he going to see? That that psalm relates to the sufferings of Christ. So let's go. Acts 4, verse 24, and we'll read 24 through 28 for now. This is Peter speaking. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of thy servant David hast said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Okay? So now Peter just quoted David, and now he's, Peter's talking again, verse 27. For of a truth against this, thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And you got so much in there. First of all, the guy that wrote First Peter first rattle out of the box actually he's already tuning into the scriptures and he's already beginning to see that scriptures that they they us anybody has applied to other things um, he's already beginning to see that this is the sufferings of Christ and that this was the cross and that this pertained to what just happened in their day with Jesus. And so, um, and, and then, then uh, of course, Peter talks about being gathered together. Okay, so remember that for the most part, First Peter, when it talks about people, it, when it talks about people that are persecuting, or not persecuting, but bringing the sufferings of Christ to someone, uh, usually he calls them evildoers. Usually they're gathered together. Usually there's at least two, okay? Where two or more are gathered together, there's Satan in the midst. <clears throat> anyway, uh, that's not a scripture. Do not quote that. Um, so, um, so notice in verse 2 it says, The Lord, get ready, The Lord and His anointed okay that's 
Psalm 2, that's Peter. The heathen rage the people imagine gain a vain thing. Uh, the rulers take counsel against the Lord and, if you will, against his anointed. Come on, think. Think, think this little chart right here. Um, so what am I saying? What am I trying to point out? I'm trying to point out that there are two here. Um, notice in verse 2 that the word against, which was used twice against the Lord and against his anointed. All right. Okay, now let's just look at the little chart with Elohim or the Trinity here. We've got the Father, we got the Son, and we got the Holy Spirit, right? And in this case, we're going to drop the one who is going through the sufferings of Christ down below so that we could leave the Adonai up above to be the overseer, to be the caretaker. All right. Against the Lord, which is the Father, and against his Christ, which is Jesus. The evildoers are bringing this down on two of the Trinity. And, surprise, surprise, we're being confronted with the reality that you don't just think of God as one person who's up there and stuff's going on. You should now begin to let the reality of Elohim capture you that your God is three in one and the scriptures are regularly talking about this dimension of three and switching places and doing things in functioning either as uh, Adonai or those who are, or him who is suffering. In this case, those who are suffering, okay, are going through these sufferings that we call the sufferings of Christ, or that Peter calls it. Okay, so I'll read that part again. Um, notice in verse 2 it says, the Lord and his anointed. This is who's being okay. This is who's being persecuted, um, and the rulers take. This is Psalm two, uh, verse one, verse two. And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, and against His anointed, saying, "Here's what these evil doers, because that's the evil doers, the heathen, the that rage, the the rulers, the take counsel." Um, Peter just started naming names. <laughs> well, there was Pilate, and there's Herod, and there's this and that. Started naming names. You're the evildoers. But right here in Psalm 2, this is, you know, David writing this, you know, a couple of weeks before the cross. No, thousands of years, okay? So, um, uh, so the stage is being set for us to discover what this means and how this works. All right, so, again, Peter confirms this. Let's say, uh, again, Peter confirms this, that this is not meant as just any old type of Christian suffering, but Christ crucified, or in our case, the sufferings of Christ. Okay, so this verse speaks of these afflictions being against two members of Elohim. Okay. Um, even the evildoers' words confirm this. Let us break their bands. Okay? Their cords. Plural. Their cords. There is an againstness. I know that's not a word. Correct, correct it, Mallory, in the teaching. <laughs> there is an againstness 
going on with evil doers in Psalm verse one, uh, uh, two, verse one and two, and down to four, where we get into all that. And what we're seeing here is who is being considered those that are in the corridor. The Father and Jesus. Jesus is in there, and Jesus isn't saying a word. He's not opening his mouth. He's blessing those that curse him. Father, forgive them. He's in the corridor, and he's passing. He's literally creating the corridor. Actually, the corridor is the nature of, of, of this Elohim before the foundation of the world, uh, as far as the nature of how you handle things. Um, Jesus and the Father don't need a crisis to handle stuff this way. <laughs> it's the way they are. Okay. But in the crisis, boy, that's where we show if we're an evildoer that's going to just react back to the evildoers, or if we're going to uh, be in that corridor and, and pass the test, meaning in, that, in those sufferings of Christ, and pass the test of being of the spirit of the one that, that God put within us. Okay, so, all right. Uh, then I wrote, but you would think that two members of Elohim would be able to deal with earthly evildoers. Wouldn't you? Why did the heathen raise? Da, 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 da. But you see, when this is that, you're not supposed to handle it. Um, one of the main things that uh, Adonai will do is that he will eventually turn the thing. He'll do it. But if you put your hand to it, there's going to be trouble. And we'll deal with that sometime. Um, so uh, so they're, not, they're not saying anything. They're not uh, justifying themselves. They're not protecting themselves. They're not, you know, doing all this. All right. So... Again, but you would think that two members of Elohim, meaning the Godhead, uh, Trinity, uh, these uh, be able to deal with earthly evildoers. But that's not how the Trinity works, or Elohim works. Those who are wounded do not resort to vengeance, self-protection, or personal assaults against the evildoers or against others. The way they operate in this case is through an Adonai. Do you get that? This is the way they work. This is the way God, the Godhead works. Those who are someone's being against, those who are someone's attacking, those of the, of the uh, Godhead, that one or two in this case will not do anything about themselves or they'll mess it up because that is meant to be left to the Adonai or my Adonai, you know, that's the words that, <laughs> that brought us all into this. Uh, bless his heart. Abraham said it, said it in Genesis 18, verse 3. Come running up to the Trinity as they come walking up, come running up to Elohim and says, my Adonai. Okay, so now, okay, well, then let's keep reading here. Uh, <clears throat> this seems to be the case in this psalm also. Not just, you know, when Jesus handled it. These two seem to be talking about another who will deal with those who, parenthesis, set themselves as evildoers against these two. There's another being spoken of here in this scripture. We're going to round out Elohim. We're going to see him 
in their function and the way they are. Okay, so uh, we find him mention this person, this other one, this Adonai, mentioned in verse four. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. <laughs> okay, he's gonna handle this. They may be, you, you know, you may be freaking out or going through stuff, but you're, you can still be with the Lord and kind of freaking out because you're in the midst of it. But he's laughing because he knows what's going to happen with this. What happened with Jesus? Well, Jesus was eventually raised from the dead, right? Okay. Um, uh, these, let's see, these two seem to be talking about another, and I capitalized that word who will deal with those who set themselves as evildoers against them. We find him mentioned in verse 4, he that sitteth in the heavens. Okay, so here we've got these two going through it, the heathen raging, the againstness of the evil doers over here coming against them. But there's one set in heaven above. It's a, He's above this. He's not in it he's above it in that sense all right um he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh the lord shall have them in derision what do you think the, the definition of that word the lord is adonai it's adonai of course it's adonai of course folks that's this is part of what i, I really hope that you can grasp is that if you understand the stuff that's going on in first peter in relationship to having an overseer over you overseeing your personal thing and he would be called an adonai in the old testament um then and you begin to comprehend just just this psalm that we're talking about here you will begin to be able to go through the bible and literally get to a place in the scriptures where you see uh, evildoers and you see uh, being against one person or two people or whatever. Uh, and uh, you'll be able to guess the name if it says, but the Lord da 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 will, you know, you can, you will know it's going to be an Adonai. It's going to be um, some a one of the Godhead in that sense that is representing you in those sufferings wanting to make sure that you come forth with Christ that's part of it so you if you're thinking only in terms of yeah he'll get them he'll have them in derision he'll do all this stuff then you're wrong because really and truly you know um, you know the the emphasis of the whole corridor or the emphasis of the whole experience there is that we in the face of evildoers and all the things that they could dream up uh, would remain allowing the lamb to manifest himself in that toward toward the evildoers love your enemies and um, and you would, under, you would clearly understand the movements of God within those situations. So, and this, guess what? This is just the first psalm we're going to deal with. There's, we got a bunch, okay? We got a bunch, and they're good. All right, so, um, He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord Adonai shall have them in derision. See, He's got it in hand. We may not see the end of the corridor. We may not see the glory of God yet, but he's got it in hand if we will stay with the nature of the one that dwells in us in the midst of that suffering. Uh, so his designation is Adonai. They, meaning the Father and the Son, they will trust in Him and He will deal with the situation after He will deal with the situation after, say it with me, 
he will deal with the situation after, after, and that's, that's so important, they, uh, after they have suffered, these two have suffered a while in a right spirit without putting their hand to it. All right. Isn't it interesting? David, he's right out of the box too. He's writing about this. He's got it. He understands. David seems to understand that there's a, there's a trinity, and he does a lot in a lot of different places. But for them, it's not the trinity because the trinity to us is a theological term that just speaks of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he serves a God that has positions and place and movements, and he works within the framework of the three. And we should too, more than Old Testament people. And by writing the very the second Psalm, and and Peter's the one who said David wrote that. He, uh, by writing that, the the Lord has allowed that the first words basically coming from David in that sense are going to be their experience dealing with the cross so that there's no question that this is the sufferings of Christ. And so I had Peter speak of it at the time. And um, manifesting in spiritual reality, clearly, I mean, I, I think David understood this flow and saw that there is a security, there is a secure, I'm sorry going to say it, use this word, but there's a secure system that if you enter the corridor you are not alone there is a framework there is an organized thing based on the nature of God as he flows as three in one all right um, so he will deal with the situation after they have suffered a while in a right spirit without putting their hand to it. All right, so let me quote from 1 Peter. Can I quote from 1 Peter? Let's quote from 1 Peter 5 and verse 10 through 11. <clears throat> okay? But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. See, you'd think that would be to us be the glory because I suffered a while and I did it good and I was da 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 da. But see, that's the one, that's not, that's not your Adonai, that's Christ in you who is your life, who also is the suffering servant, if you will, who also is the lamb that is meant to be the nature of those who go through these things so that we may be conformed to that image. See, we're looking for, oh, I want to give to the poor and, you know, I want to, I want to do Christian works and I want to, you know, be involved in the church in some way and that's being conformed. No, no, and N-O. That is not. None of those are. They may be Christ in you. They may be good things to do, but they are not the image that God is looking for. The image is this spirit. And you're not going to even know if you have it until he really puts you through something. And then usually what happens is he puts you through it. And when he puts you through it, you fail miserably because your soul is still not saved, if you understand that. And you're, you're, um, uh, you, you don't understand these things, and you don't know that you got an Adonai who is with you and, and working things. And we have, we, it'll be a while before we even get into the fullness of the working of things. What, what is his job? We're not there yet. <clears throat> but... And you, you probably need to fail that, and, but you, have, you probably need to understand, hey, this is important to his image, and then fail it really bad. 
really bad, like so selfish that you're just appalled at yourself. Well, I can't believe I just hid all that and lied about all that and did this and all that. You know, and you're just going, oh my God, I need the, I need the image of Christ. Then you get serious. But if you don't understand any of this, you're not going to be serious. You're going to think that every little thing that you do that looks like Jesus is, is, is um, the image that he wants. And it's not. I mean, you know, you don't have to believe me. Just keep on keeping on. And he'll, you know, because he, he wants this. You think I want this? I'm only teaching it because I believe with all my heart that he wants this so bad. And he wants us to be in that image. And it, like I said, Elohim started off, the three of them, and said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so, you know, it's not my, you know, it's not my deal. It's not my deal. It's, it's his. And so he'll be faithful to his plan and his heart and, you know, whatever. And he'll put you through the right things. The question is, will we grasp these things? And will we say, I want you, Lord, in, in this way? All right. So, um, uh, Peter. I didn't even read it yet, did I? Peter, or did I? Yeah, okay, I read it. First Peter 5, 10 through 11. Um, so I wrote down, once we, as those who have uh, conformed to the image of Elohim, enter into oneness, then we also must enter into the relational ways of Elohim. And this right here, Psalm 2, shows the relational ways of Elohim. Guess what? To really enter into this requires an evildoer or evildoers. It requires it. The bad stuff has to happen. because, And especially if they're just wrong, wrong, wrong. It has to happen. Because, you know, because his spirit isn't about what's right and wrong. That's the wrong tree. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's about this kind of life. All right. So, uh, what we are referring to specifically is that when entering the sufferings of Christ, we will trust our Adonai and not seek to defend ourselves. But another of the big relational things we must address is that of coming from a lower position by giving honor to our Adonai. Okay. Now, one of the things you're going to find out um, in your personal searching on this, if, you, if you're doing any of it, and I know a bunch of you are, uh, is, um, and one of the fine things you'll find out in this, in this class time, is that there is, if you go into the sufferings of Christ, there is an Adonai. It's either fa the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit, and in some cases it can be two of them, up here. In this case, literally to start off with, we found two of them being again being having evildoers against them. Okay? Um, but it could be two functioning as an Adonai up here. But um, one of the things that I'm talking about is that you need to know that there's a certain amount of honor a certain amount of lowliness that we should have in that relationship, a certain amount of, of um, brokenness, uh, not bad brokenness, but just a recognition that, and you know, when you're in that quarter, when you're in those sufferings of Christ, you'll, you'll find that the kind of brokenness I'm talking about. It's not you know, that you're destroyed or everything's so bad that da 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 da. But it is that you are not, um, you are no longer going to trust in yourself in that situation. Once, once you relinquish that to your Adonai, then what happens is, number one, from your part, you quit trying to 
get people to side with you. You quit justifying yourself. You quit trying to think about ways to get back at that person or those people. You all those things, you know, all of that. You give that up. You give it up. You um, uh, relinquish that to your Adonai. Okay. And as I said, there's a certain amount of honor and stuff that goes with that. All right. Now, for those of you, you know, many of you have been in this class. Um, <laughs> you've been either in the first Peter class or the firstborn, or you've been in both. If you've been in both, you're real blessed because you're getting the full meal deal. <clears throat> but in the in the uh, full uh, firstborn class, which this is right now, but we're we're sprinkling in Peter because he's saying the same stuff. Um, uh, we had the situation of Abraham, and uh, in uh, and I mentioned this last week or the week before. In chapter 15 of Genesis, Abraham uses that name for the first time, and he calls him um, uh, my Adonai, or he calls him Adonai. And that's the first use, not just for him, anybody in the Bible. It's the first time that it's, it comes up. Well, it, it, it kind of appears, and I'm pretty sure this is right, it kind of appears that Abraham got kind of the meaning, and that is there's somebody that's with you in your trials, but he was so carnal that he goes, okay, well, if you're my Adonai, then... Uh, why is this, or where's the da da, and all this, and all this kind of stuff? And uh, Deb suggested, and I think it was it was really good, that uh, in that fifteenth chapter, um, God appeared to Abraham and said, um, uh, "I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward." Deb suggested that this was the Lord describing Himself as an Adonai. I think there's something to it. Now, I can't prove it, and I didn't see anything. But when she said that, I went, you know what? Because where did he draw that name? He didn't just draw it out of a hat. So he uses it for the first time. But he uses it wrong. He uses it with no honor towards God. He uses it as if he's, um, um, uh, what is the word when somebody thinks that everybody owes them everything, <laughs> you know? Um uh, and so he's, he's like speaking to, to his Adonai, like, well, where is this and where is that? And how come I don't have this and all this kind of stuff? And it's, it's horrible when you under, if you truly understand Adonai as God has set this up within his nature for one another and their protection and care. Um, it's, it's reprehensible. So then we get to, um, see, I get mixed up sometimes on the chapters because I'm jumping so many books. Uh, is it 17 that he mentions him again? Yeah, and yeah, and there um, he, he says, you know, the, oh, that you would accept Ishmael. And he's saying that to his Adonai, you, you know, just don't open your mouth. If you don't know the true relationship, don't open your mouth because you're going to violate it. And then, you know, we'll get into some stuff later on. It, it, can, go, it can go really bad. When you were supposed to be someone who passes through this with the nature of Christ and everything, and you just don't understand it, so you're using him for your own uh, self, uh, it gets bad. Okay, so it's, it's just a good thing, you know, the, Jesus opened not his mouth during that whole thing, it says. All right, so um, all right. So and I'm still talking about firstborn class, but then the thing that opened this up, broke it open, started it open, was 
in uh, Genesis 18 when Elohim, the three appear, which is God, and, um, and, and Abraham runs and falls down and worships and, you know, is a completely different guy. And, he, he, and so he says to him, my Adonai, but now he's got the right spirit. Now he's got it. Now he's doing everything to please them instead of himself. All right. We say, well, I'm going through the sufferings of Christ and, and uh, he needs to jump to it and, and start helping me and please me and da 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 da. I'm sorry. He's, he's not trying to please you. He's not trying to remove everything. He's trying to get the sun out of you. And if we're thinking he's just a deliverer, you need to go talk to Jehovah. Yeah. You need to go have a good sit down with God as Jehovah. But Jehovah and his position and work, uh, God as that, and God as Adonai, they're miles apart. They're so different. They're so different. They're so different. All right, so let me finish um, one last sentence because we're already losing, losing daylight. Um, so Adonai is the one to whom we give honor as if in nature we were part of Elohim and from whom we trust for care while and after the fiery trials brought about by evildoers. So there is, there will, you know, you see Jesus, you see Jesus, you see him in the trial. You say, you know, you know, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Uh, uh, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You see this beautiful, honoring spirit instead of, Father, get me out of this. Father, you know, in the sense of just me, 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 me. And that's, that's a huge part of this. And, of course, we'll get into more of that. Um, okay. So we're going to stop there. And, uh, you know, I get excited about all this stuff. Um, I'm, I probably talk too fast. I think we do have videos and audios of these available all the time, everything. And I know for me, I had, when I was in Bible school, I had a little reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Dennis, you remember those, Jan? Anyway, I had a little reel-to-reel -reel battery-powered tape recorder. And, and I would go into all of my Bible classes and I would record them. And then, because they didn't record them, if I didn't do it, I wouldn't get it. And so, so uh, I would record them and I would take them back to my dorm room and I would listen to them again and again. And I would listen, to, I'd have them on during the night and you say, well, don't you sleep? And I said, yeah, but you know what? My spirit doesn't. <laughs> and I just, whatever method I could do, I knew that there was something there and it was of the Lord and I wanted it so bad to be real in me. And so, so may I encourage you to not listen to the class and say, well, I heard that. I'm ready for another one. Oh, my Lord, that's, you know, go back. Ask the Lord. You know, if I'm going too fast and you've got it on, on you know, some recording device, you can stop it and back it up, you know. Or if I am say something that's kind of wonky to you, you know, which could just be flat out wonky and nothing of the Lord. But it, it never hurts to go back and re-listen to it and see if, if there's something in there that is the Lord. Um, I mean, you know, none of us are all-knowing, you know. You know, I used, to, I used to hear something somebody would say, and I'd go, that ain't right. Then, then the Lord dealt with me and said, you don't know everything. You don't know everything. You're measuring everything by what you know right now. And you think that what you know right now is you're omniscient. Though you would never say that, that's what you're doing. You're acting in accordance with a mind that says, I know it all, so that I can judge everything that I don't understand and say, well, I never heard that before, or that ain't right. 
So be be broken, be open, be um, you know. Just if he says it's junk, then throw it out. But let him say it, not you, not me, not our, not our omniscient, non-omniscient minds. All right, we're going to pray. Father. There is a beauty that is flowing between you and the Son and the Holy Spirit that is eternal. It is beauty beyond what our eyes can comprehend. It's a beauty beyond earth, Earth's grasp. And we will never know that We'll never hear it from your heart if we don't have open hearts, a desire for you to tell us what's right and what's wrong, a desire to be, you to be able to rebuke us using any line or word or situation to bring us. Your rebukes are only for one purpose, to bring us more into the image of Christ so that you might have us you might have us, but have us in Him and by Him and through Him and to Him. So, Father, I don't, I, I ask that Your Spirit breathe these things. And Father, if if I'm teaching stuff that's just nothing or not worth listening to, or then, then Lord, just do something to me. Make it where I can't talk anymore. Protect these people. Save them from me and my misconceptions. But Father, if you're speaking, if you're letting the Spirit of God guide me into Jesus in these ways, and they'll benefit all of us because they'll benefit our relationship with you. We will flow with you as you are eternally instead of as Christianity has made it. So open our eyes and hearts to your word and your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thanks for showing up.